My God, my God. I love hearing the children sing. Blessing that wonderful name of Jesus. Thank God for your babies. Amen. Amen. Well, let's see what the Lord will do. Preaching takes place. It takes place by His grace and for His glory only. Amen. When the Bible is being preached, God is speaking. Yes, sir. Right? We understand that. God is speaking. Yes, sir. Let's give God the reverence that He so rightfully deserves. And the reading of his word and the preaching of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's make sure we're not doing Facebook and all kind of stuff and like that. Because God is speaking. I am not God. But I am his preacher. We did a series on a discipleship class on what it really means to listen. And everybody came out of that class and I thought, wow, I didn't know listening was as big as it is. Yes. Listening is huge. Yes. Okay. And it's commanded. So let's make sure we're giving God the due reverence mm -hmm. that is due Him. Yeah. No, we're not talking, we're not distracting, we're not doing stuff like this on our phones. If young people have, have their phones and you, you're doing that, you need to put it up. There's, there's no reason for a, for, for a phone in service. Okay. We have Bibles in the pews. I think it's still good just to open the book. I, I know it's on you. I, I understand that. I'm not that far behind. It's just good to just open the book. Okay. I'm not going to bring my phone up here and start reading from it. I, I, I just want to open the book. All right? You're not mad at me already, are you? All right. I, I say that because I love you and I want you to hear God speaking. And I want you to miss what God is saying to you. You have your uh, responsive reading. It is on page six of your programs. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to his to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are praying, and for those who are nursing infants in those days. Pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days and if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But, but, wow, for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then he will say to you, look, here is Christ, or look, there he is. Do not believe it. Or look, I have an anointing that you don't. Don't believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect together. 
But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Jesus is so gracious, isn't he? Let's pray. It's God's grace on our time together in this word. Well, Heavenly Father, I have been wrestling with you. Thank you, Master. Seeking by your grace to understand this amazing text. I thank you for the fruit of my wrestling that you have given me in terms of preparing this message. I have one primary aim, and that is for you to get glory through the preaching of your word. And I am praying that your people will hear you preaching your word through me to them, hearing it, listening with such intent and seriousness, teachable hearts, ready to receive the word of God. I pray for that grace Heavenly Father. I do realize this is your word. And I am a fallible man trying to handle your infallible word. Only you can enable me to do that. Only you can enable me to do that. And I am seeking that grace, the grace that the Spirit supplies. I yield to him. I want to be your instrument of righteousness, not only in the preaching of your word, but in the living out of it as well. I want to obey, along with my brothers and sisters, what you are saying to us. So I yield to you. Feel your servant, Holy Spirit. Grab hold and capture my mind, my emotions, and my will. My expectations are high only because I know you. Save, sanctify, encourage, strengthen, reprove, rebuke, rebuke instruct in righteousness. Draw. And if you decide, drive as well. Do your bidding through your servant in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I, I entitled this message, The Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation. I guess I could help you back there, Jordan, if I turn this on, right? It's on. The Great Tribulation. Do not be fooled by my title, if you know anything about eschatology, Amen. all right? My aim is to preach the Word of God in its context. With that said, let's remember the context, okay? Jesus this is Passion Week. Jesus is on his way to Calvary. This is, this is within that week. He has finished with the religious leaders in terms of his challenges and his teaching. And now he's on the Mount of Olives. He walks out of the temple courts, remember? And when he's walking out of the temple courts, his disciples uh, comment on the magnificence of the building itself, the temple, verse 1. Mm -hmm. 
Jesus abruptly announces that the whole thing will soon be torn down. Verse 2. This shocking prophecy, this shocking pronouncement that the temple will be destroyed triggers a couple of important questions from the disciples. Verse 4, tell us when will this happen and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Because when the disciples heard that the temple would be destroyed, they uh, associated the destruction of the temple with the end of the age. Yes, Jesus then launches into this lengthy discourse that's found in uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24 and 25, here in Mark 13, and also in Luke 21. And it's called the Olivet Discourse, since Jesus is on the Mount of Olives when he answers the questions. The disciples' two questions refer to two different events. The destruction of Jerusalem and its temple by the Romans in, that happened in AD 70 and Jesus' second coming at the end of the age. Jesus' answer in the form of the Olivet Discourse also speaks of these two events. This is important, hear me. He, he, he uses the destruction of the temple in the near future as a pattern for the judgments that will occur in the distant future when he returns. We've already seen some of that in verses uh, uh, 5 through 13, right? A lot of the things that he talks about would happen before A.D. 70. We, 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 we see and I showed you passages where in the last days the same thing, mm -hmm. right? So Jesus intentionally connects two significant events and uses the first event, which is the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, as a preview mm -hmm. of the second event, All right. which is Three. the second coming of Christ. Mm -hmm. So, the near future is intertwined with the far future. Walk with me. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it's, it, it, it's sort of like looking at a mountain range from a distance. Okay? When you look at the mountain from a great distance, uh, they all appear as a single range just far away. But then when you get closer, you can tell that some, that some peaks are in, in fact much closer than others. So in the same way, some, some of what Jesus says in this discourse will be fulfilled in the first century, near future. And some of what he says will be fulfilled at the end of the age. Far future. That's the context. That's the, the, that is the best way to understand the Olivet Discourse. Okay? <clears throat> now, today I want to look at this one main point. I only want to preach verse 14. And I want to highlight the point that Jesus highlights in verse 14. I want to give it the very language that Jesus gives it. I want you to think about this main point in verse 14, the prophecy of the abomination. That's what's in verse 14, the prophecy of the abomination. Now, before I uh, seek to unpack the prophecy in terms of subpoints, 
I need you to understand what the first half of this verse means. Let, let, let's just look at what it means first. Let, let, let's, let, let's just do some interpretation and, 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 and grab an understanding of what it means. And when I say the first half, half I'm referring to the, these words. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, and then in parentheses we have, let the reader understand. I, I'm referring to that part of the verse. Now, general signs are characteristic of the present age. The general signs that are characteristic of the present age now give way to the one obvious sign that will take place before the destruction of Jerusalem. The abomination that causes desolation. I argue contextually, and I will unpack this further as we go on, this represents the answer to the disciples' question in verse 4. The question is, what will be the sign that all these things are about to, uh, to be accomplished? Now, the injunctions throughout verse 5 through 13 are, are for patient endurance. Do not worry. Do not fear. Right? But now, uh, there's the command in verse 14, flee to the mountains. Because destruction is about to take place. So now Jesus gives them a sign. Are you with me? And he says, when you see, that looks forward to a definite, observable future event. The time is left indefinite. When you see, whenever you see, the abomination of desolation. The term of abomination is actually used in Daniel, and I'll speak more about it in a moment, but let me just help you to understand what it means. That's just the term, abomination. Uh, it means something loathsome, something detestable, something repugnant to God. The term is often used in the context of pagan worship. So the Hebrew phrase as a whole means the abomination that makes desolate. Follow me. Jesus is saying this desecration produces or results in the desolation of the holy place. In the Old Testament, the term uh, abomination denoted idolatry, sacrilege. You find it uh, used that way, for example, in, in Deuteronomy 29, 16, and 17, 1 Kings 11, 6, and 7, 17, 16, 3, 23, 13, Ezekiel 8, 9 through 17. You find it used in the context of idolatry. So the, uh, the expression uh, denotes that which as a symbol of hedonism. It denotes that which is detestable to God and his people. Amen. Okay? It's not the destruction of the temple, but rather it's desecration. Are you with me? That's what abomination means. Now, Jesus goes on to say, standing where Standing where he ought not to be. Now, Mark leaves the place un un unidentified, but in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24, verse 15, Matthew says he's standing in the holy place. The temple, the sacred sanctuary itself. The holy place was a special place uh, in the temple uh, on earth. And Mark's expression here lays stress on the violation involved. Standing, that's a masculine participle. 
Abomination is neuter. Now, Mark deliberately uses the masculine, which points to the fact that he regarded the abomination as personal. He rather than it. Mark is thinking of a person. Right? Mark is thinking of a man. Just want to give you the understanding of the verse. This, this section. Then we have these parentheses. Let the reader understand. Like, oh my goodness. Let the reader understand. Now follow me. Jesus did not say that. Let the reader understand. Let the reader understand is God breathed, but Jesus didn't say it. Let the reader understand comes from the pen. It is an editorial uh, 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 insertion by the author, Mark. And we need to think about what that means. Because what, what, what that means helps us, actually, with understanding. It's an editorial comment made by Mark. And it's present tense, and it calls for, uh, uh, the reader needs to have ongoing wisdom. You need to have ongoing wisdom from God as you seek to interpret this prophecy. I want to understand means to grasp or comprehend something on the basis of careful thought. It actually calls attention to the importance of what is written. In other words, the reader needs to think real hard about Jesus' words, Jesus' prophecy here. You know who the reader is this morning? You Amen. and me. I love the Bible. It's so amazing. Because Mark, as he writes, he's saying to his, uh, uh, the people of God who are being persecuted, let the reader understand. But no matter what age we're in, Mark says, when you look at this prophecy, let the reader understand. I need to unpack it a little bit more. Mark is saying, look more deeply into this. Because what is said is less than what is meant. You didn't hear that. Oh, yeah. Mark is saying, you need to look more deeply into this because what is said is actually less than what is meant here. In other words, Mark is saying, Jesus' words is actually swollen with meaning. You know, when, 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 when uh, any part of your body is swollen, your eye, ear, whatever, head, it's larger than normal. Right? Amen. Mark is saying, uh, Jesus' words is swollen with meaning. It's more, it's more here than uh, what, you, what you actually see. And you got to think deeply about this prophecy. Now what is clear to us at this point, Jesus is saying that there will be some abomination, a person that will pollute and empty the holy place and he's saying that all of his followers need to take notice of this. This will be a sign. So, I raise the question, what are we to understand about the abomination of, 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 of desolation? But uh, uh, even another question, to what does it point? To what does it point? And that, that's my main question. Because you get up more understanding about it when you understand to what does it point. 
Now you need to understand something about me, okay? Uh, th 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 there's actually three interpretations of this passage from scholars that I highly respect. Okay? I have to be convinced in my heart of what God is saying, yes. first of all. I'm not trying to impose my eschatology on the passage. Okay? I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to be a good uh, premillennials, good all millennial, or, 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 or whatever. It, or whatever. And, and I, I, I've read some very uh, good works that jump from verse 13 all the way to the Great Tribulation period. To what does it point? What I like to do with a difficult passage like this, I like to preach what I can prove biblically. So that, that, that's what I want to do. I, I, I want to preach what I can prove biblically. Okay? So, you ready, Sister Newman? <laughs> Sister Newman said, what is he going to eat to that uh, first cell point? I, I'm ready, Sister Newman. To what does it point? Three things. Number one, to what does the abomination of desolation point? Number one, it points to a prior event already passed. To what does it point? Number one, it points to a prior event that's already passed. The abomination of desolation comes from the book of Daniel. It's found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. You can jot it down. Daniel chapter 11, verse 31. Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. I want to highlight uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 31, because that is in fact Jesus, Jesus is definitely referencing Daniel. In fact, go to, well, you can read it when you get home, but go to Matthew 24. Uh, Matthew actually says he's referencing Daniel. Okay? I want to highlight Daniel 11, 31. Listen to Daniel's prophecy. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. Sounds so familiar, doesn't it? Now, when Jesus spoke this, the hearers mm -hmm. of this prophecy would have, 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 have been familiar and would have immediately thought of something that happened centuries earlier and they would have known about it. Mm -hmm. Amen. So what happened centuries earlier because uh, Daniel just says uh, that, that uh, uh, forces are going to come and they will set up the abomination that makes desolate. What happened? Well, Antichus, the fourth Epiphanes, desecrated the holy temple of God in 167 BC. That infamous Greek king conquered Jerusalem. Listen to what he did. He erected a statue of Zeus in the temple courts. Then he turned around and sacrificed pigs in the holy of holies. That was an outrageous sacrilege that uh, enraged the people of God, the Jews. In addition to that, he forced the priests to eat the pig's meat. In addition to that, he called himself Theos Epiphanes, which means manifest God. So he was ruthless. He oppressed the, the people of God, of God. He 
slaughtered thousands and he sold many into slavery. That was a very foul, wouldn't you agree? Desecration of the holy place that, that actually provoked one of the most important revolutions of the Jews against foreign invaders. Maccabees, the book of Maccabees has that. Uh, the, the Jewish people saw the holy temple, I've already told you, as holy, as sacred, not because uh, of the materials that were used to build it, but because it was the place where the Holy One of Israel dwelt and met with them. No site in the world was more sacred than the temple. So to devour it with pagan sacrifices was the greatest insult one could inflict on the people of God. Amen. So when Jesus mentioned this, you better believe his disciples would have remembered it points to a past event. Daniel chapter 11. Yes, sir. Okay, that's the event. But so, important to a past event, this, this prophecy. But secondly, it points to a prophetic event in the near future. They would remember the past, but it points to a prophetic event in the near future that happened about 40 years after Jesus' prophecy. I would argue, and I'll give you my contextual biblical reasons why I argue, I believe that this points to the destruction of the temple in AD 70. There are three reasons I would argue that it does. First, there's the use of the pronoun you. When you, but when you see, that naturally refers to the disciples. When you see the abomination of desolation, he means when the first disciples see that event. Mm -hmm. So the you is our first clue that Jesus is talking to his disciples about this event that will happen in the near future. That's the second reason that I argue it points to the destruction of the temple. Mm -hmm. Secondly, when you look at the context, you find specific details that make sense in light of a specific first century audience. For example, note the specific geography mentioned at the end of verse 14. Right. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. I'm certainly not in Judea. <laughs> what possible meaning could that have to anyone who does not live in that region of the world? Jesus is talking about some event will not affect the whole world, but only those living in and around Jerusalem. Mm. Right? That's the context. Mm. That's the third reason. You remember where the Olive Discourse is found? Matthew 24, Luke 21, Mark 13. Let's see what Luke says. About the same thing. Luke 21, verse 20. Luke writes, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Uh oh. Luke gets very specific, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Let me give you the history. You with me? 
First, in, in, in 68 AD, there were some Jewish zealots that took control of the temple, desecrated it by allowing robbers into the Holy of Holies and committing murders in the temple itself. That happened. Then, uh, in order to crush the Jewish revolt, in AD 66, the Roman general, Titus, worked his way south until he seized and conquered Jerusalem on the ninth month, August 29th, in AD 70. Now, at first, the temple was ordered to be preserved. But when it was later gutted by fire set by one of the soldiers, the order came from Caesar to raise the whole city and the temple to the ground. Now here's something that's recorded historically that I find pretty remarkable. Once the temple was burned, the soldiers, the Roman soldiers, were so eager to retrieve the gold which melted and had flowed into the cracks between the stones. You know what they did? They overturned uh, the huge stones uh, 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 of the burned out building to retrieve the gold. They overturned them? Wait a minute. The stones. Go back to yes. verse yes. two. Yes, yes. And Jesus said to them, the to him, do you, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Hmm. <laughs> Precisely. Mm -hmm. Not one stone was left standing upon another. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about the, the abomination of desolation here. The Roman general Titus, he entered the temple sanctuary at the climax of the destruction. And when the Roman uh, army marched, they, they, they carried uh, their banners with eagle figurines on the end of the poles. And they entered the temple with these banners. Mm -hmm. Idolatry, okay? Mm -hmm. They set up their standards uh, in the temple. They offered sacrifices and they proclaimed Titus to be the emperor. Then Titus turned around and removed sacred items to be used in his victory procession. Mm. That was abomination Amen. of desolation. Mm. Now, we ask why, why in the world did all of this happen? I hear you. God. Mm. God's judgment against Jerusalem's sin. How do I know that? Well, Luke helps us again. When Luke described the city's destruction in Luke's gospel, in Luke 21, 22, uh, our Lord says, these are days of vengeance, he said, to fulfill all that is written. That's what he said. Then, he said in Luke 21, 23, there will be wrath against this people. And when you hear vengeance and wrath, that's the vocabulary of judgment. Amen. Vengeance is the unique prerogative of Almighty God who, who alone has the right to judge people for their sins. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Wrath is God's holy hatred of sin, which, which is his settled determination to punishment. So, the fall of Jerusalem was an act of God's justice that actually fulfilled the ancient law of Moses. You remember Moses in Deuteronomy 29, 15, and 16? If you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes, then curse shall be your city. Mm. That's why I came. God used the enemy mm -hmm. to judge his people. So, Jesus is saying that in the end, the whole temple sacrifice had to be destroyed Along with those who defended it, they perished. 
Jesus declares, even in this indirectly, that he's the once and for all sacrifice for all the sins of his people. He's the one to whom all of the sacrifices in the temple pointed. And once he died, once he rose again, the old temple in Jerusalem was no longer the dwelling place of God and God would not allow it to stand against the true temple of Christ. It had to be torn down. God used it. the Romans to tear it down. And they were, they were, they were his instruments of divine justice. I think the men will walk with me when I say God is just that sovereign. When we reject the Lord Jesus Christ, when we turn from him, why do we expect mercy? This is a shocking reminder of what our own sins deserve. Yes. We all deserve the wrath and curse of God. Don't we? If you haven't come to that understanding, I'm not sure you're a Christian. If you haven't come to the understanding of what you deserve, why would you flee to Christ? If you haven't come to the understanding of what you deserve, then what was Christ doing on the cross? Putting on makeup? Why, why did he suffer the way he did? Because he was in your place and my place. He was receiving what we deserve. Right? Tell you something else we learned here. Love, you and I, we're going to make sure we take seriously what Jesus is saying about judgment. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Stop procrastinating. Mm -hmm. This comes from a man who has a perfect track record. Every single time he said something, yes, sir. Happened. Yes, sir. it happened precisely the way he said it. Yes, sir. Because he's not just a man. Amen. He's God. Yes, sir. Right? He's the omniscient Son of God. He has all knowledge. He has full foreknowledge of the future. And everything that he says comes to pass because the future is contained in him. Whatever Jesus says about the coming day of judgment, yes, sir. about eternal damnation, it's going to happen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You die without Christ, it's going to happen. Yes, sir. Yeah. I have a third. What does this point to? Well, it points to something happened in the past. It points to the destruction of the temple in AD 70 in the near future, which is 40 years afterwards. Mm -hmm. That's, that's a third point I see. Because I seek to look at scripture in its broader context to understand why these words are so swollen. Mark, why, why do you say we have to look deeply into this? Well, it point, because it points to a prophetic event in the distant future. Watch this. Daniel 9, 27, as well as uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 11, uh, describes end time event. Mm -hmm. An end time, end time event that is actually situated at the midpoint of Daniel's 70th week. When the Antichrist will set up his throne in a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and declare himself to be God. Follow me. Listen to Daniel 12, 11. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes desolate is set up, watch this, there shall be 1,200 
and 90 days. Hmm. Wonder how long that is. Paul, can you help us a little bit? Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, he's describing this man of, 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 of lawlessness. He says, let no one deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that, watch this, he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That doesn't happen before the destruction of the temple. Now listen very carefully. Beloved, Paul's description of this man of lawlessness, don't you agree that it is conceptually similar to the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be in Mark 13, 14? Amen. Absolutely. I mean, you don't have to be a brain surgeon to get that, do you? Listen to what Paul says in, in, in 2 Thessalonians 9, uh, uh, I mean, chapter 2, verse 9 and 10. His coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. That Antichrist is coming. He's going to be a peacemaker first. He's going to make an alliance with, with Israel. And then he's going to turn around and turn against the Jewish people. He's going to massacre them and he's going to desecrate the temple for a period. Uh, well, how long is 1,290 days? Three and a half years. Where did I get three and a half years from? Well, you, you can do it, you can calculate it, but I didn't have to calculate it. You know why? Because the Bible tells me. Listen to Revelation 11 too. Then I was given a measuring rod like a staff and I was told, and I was told, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there. But do not measure the court outside the temple. Leave that out, for it is given over to the nations, and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. This Antichrist is real person that's going to make war with believers. Revelation 13:7. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile, he's going, to, he's going to kill many for their unwavering faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How do I know that? Because you're going to find them in Revelation 6, 9 through 11. But listen to Revelation 13, 7. Also, it was allowed the Antichrist to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given it over every tribe and people and language and nations. Ooh. But no, in the midst of all of that, no true believer will forsake their faith in Jesus Christ. Listen to Revelation 9 through 11. And I, 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 and I know what the good premillennials will say. Well, wait, we're not the world. We, we will not be here. I, I, I challenge you to examine yourself to see if you be of the faith. Because if you're not of the faith, you will be here. Revelation 6, 9 through 11. That's why I'm not going to talk about rapture or anything else. I'm going to talk about what it says. Uh, Revelation 6, 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell upon the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their fellow, fellow brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. This Antichrist will commit the ultimate sacrilege by setting up an image of himself in the temple. 
he will order everyone to worship him. And everyone who does not will be killed. That's clear. Second Thessalonians 2 and 4, Revelation 13, 14 and 15. And that does not happen before AD 7. You can't read Daniel in Revelation and, and impose some preterist view on it. Let's look at what the text is saying. So, to what does it point? It definitely points to something that's already happened. Daniel chapter 11. It definitely points to something that is near future 40 years later. The context screams that. And it definitely, as we look at the broader context of Holy Scripture, it definitely points to something that is a distant future. Amen. Paul, children, all screamed that. Sure Daniel as well. Amen. Right? Amen. And if you're resting in your church membership, right. hear the last point. Right. This is a prophetic sign, lastly, to flee. It's the last part of the verse, I'm done. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Oh, but pastor, you said we're not in Judea. So what does this verse have to do with us? Well, follow me. Flee to the mountains. Flee. Why? Because judgment is coming. That's coming in the Old Testament. It's not, it, fleeing is not the sign of a coward. Flee, flee means save yourselves. So something new can be started. <laughs> you remember Noah and his family? Save themselves from the, from the judgment of the flood? Because Noah built an ark. And they got in it. Uh, angels urged Lot and his, his wife and daughters to flee to the mountains. Or, or you will be swept away by the destruction coming to Sodom and Gomorrah. Genesis 19 verse 17. The angel said, you need to flee. Isaiah urged the people to flee Babylon before God brought judgment. Isaiah 48, verse 14, verse 20. At different times, Jeremiah called people to, to leave both Jerusalem and Babylon. Jeremiah 6, 1 and 2. Chapter 51, Jeremiah, verses 6 through 10. Ezekiel 7, 15 and 16. Warning them, judgment on Israel. Ezekiel said, fugitives, flee to the mountains. If you flee, you experience victory. Follow me. This fleeing is something different because cities were normally places of safety and security. So narrowly, the sensible thing to do in a time of danger would be run to the, from the surrounding countryside and get behind the wall of the city. Yes, sir. But Jesus said, no, no, do the opposite. Uh, because this is more than about Titus and the Roman soldiers. Do something the very opposite because you will not be safe anywhere. You won't survive security in the normal place you would think you have it. Y'all don't even hear me preaching. Oh, go on home, it's 1231. Uh, uh, flee to the mountains. Why? Because when judgment of God comes, all of your security will be demolished. You will not find security in what you think is secure. Jesus is so merciful. He said this to his own people. Here's what you need to do in the time of judgment. I want to protect you. I want to preserve you. Run. When you see this happening, the abomination that causes desolation, run. Flee. Here's the principle to make sure you get. The only safety for them and for us is to believe the words of Jesus. Amen. Not just his words about judgment, 
But you need to believe his words about saving grace. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, glory. Yeah. Right? See, the principle, believe in Christ, holds true for every believer in the dangers of life. It doesn't matter how great or how small. Your only hope, your only refuge is found in the promises, in the word of God. You can say you don't believe it if you want to. I would say let me know how that works out when judgment comes, but uh, I, I will not be anywhere near you. Jesus. You gotta believe the word of God. Yes. How do you not believe somebody who's never been wrong? Amen. He tells Nathaniel, Oh, I saw you under that tree. Amen. And Nathaniel was nowhere near. <laughs> All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He says to the Pharisees before Abraham, uh, uh, was I am. Right? He says to his disciples, uh, I'm going to die, and, 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 and these men are going to take me, and I'm going to be beaten, and, and this, all, all this is going to happen, and it hasn't even happened yet, and then it happens on Good Friday. Then he says, before it happens, and after all of that, after he's beaten beyond recognition, he says, but I'm getting up the third day. Amen. He has power to lay his life down and power to pick it up and we're wondering whether we ought to believe him or not. I wish I had some noise. I'm coming to a close. To the weak, doesn't he promise strength? I know I found strength in him. I got it right now. To the troubled, doesn't he promise peace? To the tempted, doesn't he promise a way of escape? To the repentant, doesn't he promise full deliverance and full forgiveness of all of your sins? Do you have somewhere to run? Yeah, when you run by faith, you run trusting in the word of Christ. You run trusting in the purpose of the, the person of Jesus Christ. You run trusting in him and him alone. You want to flee judgment, you better turn to Christ. You go on living the way you live and you think Christ is not coming? He's coming. Judgment is coming just like he said. Listen, it's noted in history and atheists cannot say that the temple was not destroyed in 87. An atheist can't say that. Uh, well, well, uh, well I, I know that happened, but oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, yeah, Jesus said it would happen. Yes. It's all a part of his sovereign plan. Yes. Then run to Christ. You better repent of your sins and turn from your life of sin. Your whole life is wrong, not just the little things that you do. Your whole life. You need a new life. And that can only be found in Christ. And anybody that's not in Christ will not escape judgment. Because it's coming. Yes. It's going to be worse than what you see in the text. In fact, it's going to be a billion times worse than what you see in the text. In fact, that's minor to what the ultimate eternal damnation will be. We're busy defining success for our children and our families and money and where they live and where they work and all of that and not pointing them to Jesus. Amen. Amen. And then they, they, they've got their security and where they work and how much money they make and where they live and whether they have a PhD or not and they have all of that without Jesus. Well, Jerusalem was normally a place of safety. It had a wall of defense. Titus waited outside the wall, yeah. tore the wall down, because nothing on earth is secure. It all has to pass away. But I am in Christ. Hallelujah. Glory to His name. I'm secure in Christ. I ran to Him some years ago, and I found out that nothing can separate me from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Neither height nor death, no, no matter what comes to pass. Yes, sir. Hey, glory.
glory. I beg for your soul today. Turn to Jesus. You don't have time to leave here lost. Turn to Christ. Jesus tells them to flee. Yes. Yeah. And I close with this. It's Passion Week. Mm -hmm. Jesus, two to three days after he says this, he's going to be, he's going to be on the cross. Yes. Mm -hmm. He tells them to flee. You know why? <laughs> because God's judgment is coming. Yeah. Yeah. On Israel. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. On Jerusalem. Yeah. On the temple. He says, you flee that judgment. Run to the hills of Judea. Glory to God. But he tells them to do what he can't do. Mm. Y'all better come on home now. You better come on, Christian, because that right there, I, I got it. He tells them to do what he can't do. Because on Friday, judgment's coming. Hey, glory. Judgment's coming on Friday. He tells us, flee. Run. Yeah. But when judgment comes, Christ says, I can't run. Yes, Lord. I've got to be marched yes. from judgment hall yes. to judgment hall. I've got to be beaten beyond recognition. I've got to let him put me on the cross. I've got to be lifted up. I've got to have the wrath of my father come down on me. I can't run. But I'm not running. Because if I run, then you have nowhere to turn. But the good news of the gospel is, he didn't run. He died. I'm going in. He died. Oh, my daddy coming out of me. I said he died. One Friday. He died one time. Didn't he die? Yeah. Went down in the tomb. Yeah. Stayed there. Yeah. All night. Friday night. Saturday night. But early Sunday morning. Just a little while. Before day. He got up out of the grave. Oh God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for Jesus. Oh Christ, the sun is rock out standing. All of the grass is seeking sand. There is a fountain. The old and blood flowing from the man who was made. Sin is plunge. Beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stain. I have a savior. And he's sweet, I know. Dark clouds may rise. Strong winds may blow. But I tell the world, wherever I go, I've got to save you. And he's sweet, I know. Glory to God. Glory to the rock of our salvation. Run to Jesus this morning. When they see, meditate on what you heard from Christ. And if you're not saved today, Look to him by faith. Amen. Give up your life. Yes. Surrender all. Yes. And say, Lord, I trust you. Yes. And what you've done for me. Yes. At Calvary, I believe your word. Yes. I believe that judgment is coming. But I believe you took the judgment I deserve. Yes. And I rest yes, in Christ alone. Christ alone. Anybody that comes to him. Y'all go ahead.